uh, this is Action on Nonviolence's uh, webinar, kindly joined by a number of experts on the issue of uh, children under attack uh, in conflict. Um, the, 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 there's a, a, a terrible truth that between 2011 and 2020, at least 17,000 children were reported in English language media only as having been killed or injured by explosive violence around the world. Now, one thing that we know at Action on Nonviolence, where we run a global monitor of explosive violence, is that this is merely a proportion of global harm. We don't capture everything because it is just English language. But what we do know uh, is that despite 17,000 just being an absolute minimum of child casualties, um, we do know that when children are faced with the use of explosive weapons, in both the short and the long term, there are profound impacts. And this has led us to publish today our report, Children Under Attack. And we've been very kindly uh, um, joined today by a number of, of very distinguished speakers who will be able to talk about uh, the painful subject of children in conflict and the immediate and long-term impact of that. Uh, before we begin, I introduce the speakers. Can I start off just by asking audience members to turn off your microphones and cameras during the event? Um, questions can be added to the chat at any time, and I will take those questions. Um, if the same sort of question is asked, I'll, I'll roll it up into a single question at the end. But I'll pose the questions in the Q&A session at the end. And if we have any extra time beyond then, we may be able to have directed questions to members of the panel. Um, but I'd like, first of all, to thank the, the four speakers today. Um, in order of, of speaking, we have Dr. Salaya San first. Um, Dr. Hassan is, is a practicing A&E doctor, a good friend of mine, um, and a, a former captain in the Royal Army Medical Corps and a broadcaster. You may well have seen her, uh, her reports on either BBC's Newsnight or Panorama, uh, a whole variety of work that she's done as a reporter. Uh, she's also reported on uh, a BBC Inside Out special on troops returning from service in Afghanistan. Um, Salah, in addition, is doing a PhD at the University of Cambridge as we speak about exquisitely the impact of attacks on healthcare in conflict zones. And so I know that this subject matter is very close to her heart. And I asked her along to speak from a personal perspective about witnessing the impact of conflict on children. And she'll be talking about her experience of an attack on a school in Syria. Next to speak is Verity Hubbard, who's a researcher at Action on Armed Violence and the author of Childhood Under Attack, A Timeline of Explosive Weapon Harm. Uh, Verity uh, studied theology at the University of Oxford and has a master's from the University College London in Russian and Eastern European politics. She's previously worked as a security analyst monitoring conflicts in the MENA region, specializing on Libya and has also worked in the UK Parliament and for think tanks in both London and Brussels. And I must say that the work she's produced is uh, of, of real quality, and I would recommend all of you um, to, to, to look at the report, which we will also share um, with, uh, in emails to all of those who signed up to this event. Um, next to speak is Dr. Michael von Bertle. Um, Major General Michael von Bertley is the former Director General of the British Army Medical Services and a member of the Pediatric Blast Injury Partnership. Um, he's worked alongside AOAV on a number of collaborative projects over the years, um, and he became Humanitarian Director for Save the Children International in November 2013, and has overseen humanitarian responses in the Philippines and the Middle East and Africa, and is the non-executive director of the Salisbury Hospital. Michael will be speaking today on blast injury effects in the short and long term, gaps in blast injury research, and the work of the Pediatric Blast Injury Partnership. Um, next to speak is, is, is Rocco Bloom. Rocco uh, not only sits on the International Network of Explosive Weapons with Action on Armed Violence, but is Head of Policy and Advocacy at War Child UK. He works with domestic and international politicians, policymakers, and influencers to push for greater support for children affected by conflicts across the world. And I think it, it's, it's wonderful to have somebody from War Child speaking on this event because I know it goes so close to the work that they, they so rigorously do. 
Rocco will be speaking on grave violations against children, accountability for states and armed groups, and intergenerational reverberation of conflict and the impact that has on fragile states. So um, I'd like now to pass over to Salaya, um, who's speaking to us from Wales, and um, would be is really looking forward to hearing about your direct experiences of this painful subject. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Ian. And thank you, Action on Armed Violence, for um, asking me to speak today about this, about this issue. And isn't it a shame that we actually have to have a report about children under attack in this day and age? Um, but there we have it. Since 2011 to 2020, we have had over 17,000 um, children who have been injured or killed um, within conflict zones um, around the world. Uh, it's a terrible number. Um, and I, as I looked at that figure, I thought about the 28 children that I saw and cared for in 2013 in Syria. Um, I was uh, at all in one attack on one day um, and it wasn't something that was unusual or out of the ordinary. You only had to be in that area for two or three consecutive days and you would have seen a repeat of that incident. Um, uh, in 2013, I was in Syria uh, with the NGO Hand in Hand for Syria, who helped run a hospital. Well, it was more of a makeshift uh, medical post, if you like, because the established hospitals and healthcare infrastructure within northern Syria had been decimated and destroyed by the Syrian um, authorities and regime and its own military. So uh, that's the added tragedy that not only was there a lack of uh, appropriate health care, um, they then, uh, uh, for, for normal health care, they then rendered an increase in the number of people needing health care by attacking them. And one of the the sights in their in their eyes were schools, schools, hospitals, and schools, um, and this has, as as Ian's mentioned, um, evolved into the PhD that I'm studying, um, looking at the impact of attacks against healthcare. So let's go back to that day in August in 2013. It, I was working in the um, emergency room. Um, it was a quiet day. Um, we hadn't had many people in um, and it was a welcome relief. It was like a, a breath of, 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 of a time to just sit and contemplate and drink some tea. Um, but then um, as we were sitting there, we began to hear sirens and a noise level that was increasing. And within a half an hour, the emergency room was packed. It was packed, it went from nothing packed and the only reason that had happened is because we'd had um, an attack on a school and within minutes we had a mass casualty situation, uh, a major incident in the area if you like and that's what it would be called were it to happen here in the UK. It's a mass casualty situation. We, I, as I tried to assess the area around me as to what was happening, I noticed that every single person that was injured, um, ranging from uh, superficial burns to whole body surface area burns, were children. They were all predominantly uh, between the ages of 11 to 18. There were, there were some, very, some young adults in their early 20s, um, just a couple, and there was also a baby in fact, the first patient that, that suggested that something was amiss was um, a baby less than one years old who was brought in with scald-like burns over their body. Um, it took a while to elicit what had happened. Um, initially, we thought it was a chemical attack um, because it was during the time when 
uh, chemical weapons were being used, probably still are, but I don't know. But at that time, it was all in the news um, about um, devastating drops of chemical weapons. On this event, um, we braced ourselves. We were handed masks, like the FFP3s that we wear at work now, um, to wear as we worked. And I remember that day specifically thinking, OK, so, okay we've been hit nearby by a chemical weapon and I'll probably begin to feel the effects of it myself but just work because you have got a number of children in agony in front of you so just work and when you feel it you'll feel it but just keep going in the meantime and I remember that still vividly um, and I also remember the heat the heat it was a hot August day but it was the heat from the bodies of the children that was unforgettable the, what had actually happened was that they were in school and again it was a makeshift school because schools had been destroyed and closed so uh, a, a, a village um, in Atarib uh, had decided in the area of Atarib just on the outskirts of Aleppo the community had decided to try to continue the education of their children so a school had been opened up in a building and they were all there for afternoon classes and a plane had been spotted circling um, overhead. We thought it was actually, we thought the hospital was the target. So we'd already been warned that we might have to evacuate, but it wasn't us. The target was the school. How obscene is that? Um, and what, what happened next was um, the headmaster had uh, suggested um, uh, that parents come and take their children home because there was aircraft above. So it was at the point when, and this is how calculated this is and how I hope there is a day in court for these people. Um, they waited until all parents and family members had come to gather their children to take them home. When the children were actually leaving and starting together, that's when they dropped the bomb and they devastated the area. I went to see it a few days later, the smell of the, of the fuel. It was a Soviet made um, thermal bomb uh, with carrying jellied fuel uh, that on impact, the jellied fuel would hit a surface and burn deeper. So if that hit skin, it would hit the skin and it would burn even deeper. We had 28 children, a number of them, I. Um, Two died instantly because the bomb landed on top of them. Um, um, others died on the way to the hospital. More still died on the way from our hospital to Babel Hawa on the border, uh, where they were um, going to be evacuated across to Turkey because that was the only route. That was all we could offer. At that point, all I could do that day with the very limited equipment that I had was to stabilise as much as I could, stabilise with fluids, with um, uh, uh, trying to get IV access, intravenous access. I didn't have the other needles that we needed to break through skin, the interosseous needles. We only had the most basic equipment. We hardly had any real analgesia. Um, these children needed critical care. We didn't have it. So we had to evacuate them in whatever way we could. Um, we're not talking about evacuation in our uh, fancy critical care ambulances. We're talking in the backs of vehicles and, and vans that were calling themselves ambulances to the Turkish border. And from there, they went into the medical world that you and I would recognise of critical care ambulances. I mean, they were just lined up, ready to take children. I think to this day, I think that's extraordinary that another country offered its services in that way to these children, lining up without question. I mean, um, but it's so tragic that that is how it has to happen. A number of them didn't make it. I know one child that I was looking after and I spent hours... I was just trying to help him, died on the way to Babel Hawa. He was 14. Um, uh, and I will always remember him calling out for water. So it was just devastating. This eight years ago, it's still as if it was now. I, I'm still in that room. Um, so the fact that we are not letting um, this this go away, we are scrutinising it and the Action on Armed Violence has done this report um, and that we 
we are continuing to bear witness and we are continuing to uh, humanize each one of those statistics, I think is vital because a crime was carried out and they are continuing to be carried out under international humanitarian law, dropping bombs in hospital on hospitals and schools um, is illegal. Um, we can say it's illegal, but then there has to be uh, a route to justice. This cannot happen and continue to happen with impunity. So I'm, I know it was eight years ago, um, and those children, the ones that survived, are still living with the scars of it now. Some of, some of them, the ones that survived, have facial disfigurement from, from the burns that they had, and then also from the double whammy of not having the dedicated appropriate burns care that they needed afterwards. Um, and this is so super calculated and by Syria doing this to its own children, they've just killed their own future. And I, I wholeheartedly support the work that Action on Armed Violence is doing to keep this in the public domain and to raise awareness about this because we need to keep speaking for children who are stuck in this. Some of them were born in war, they've grown up in war, they've known no other life other than war. And uh, we absolutely need to do whatever we can to make their future safe. That's very powerful words. Thank you very much, Salai. It's re really good of you to, to share those those painful memories. But I guess I think it, you know, actually it, it really roots in the truth that everything that we seek to do here is is uh, research on actual harm. This isn't imaginary. This is something that is, is sort of experienced on a daily basis in some of the world's most uh, dangerous areas. Um, and on that, I'll now pass to Verity to give the highlights of AOAV's uh, report published today. Thank you, Verity. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and I hope you can all see it. Um, yeah. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, fantastic. So, as Ian mentioned, between 2011 and 2020, we have recorded this figure of 17,035 children being killed and injured by explosive violence worldwide. And added to that is an additional 807 casualties from unexploded ordnance. Now, as Ian mentioned, our data represents the absolute minimum of child harm. It's an impression rather than an exact measure. But even though these figures are fractional, they are still extremely bleak. Um, before I go any further, I want to address why AOAV chose to look at explosive weapons and why look at children. So with explosive weapons, when they are used in populated areas, uh, their effects are completely indiscriminate. They are unlike, uh, unlikely to be able to distinguish between an armed group's headquarters or the child play group next door. Their wider effects mean that they have the capacity to damage infrastructure, agriculture, electricity systems in the way that other conventional weapons simply don't have the capacity to do. Secondly, explosive weapons are the biggest killer of children in armed conflict. Save the Children in 2019 found that of the five most deadliest conflicts worldwide, 72% of the child casualties were killed by explosive violence. And so why children? Well, as we'll see, children are uniquely physiologically vulnerable to the effects of a blast. But also, often the damage that is inflicted upon children is irreversible. It takes place at critical times in a child's cognitive and physical development. If I give the example of uh, a rocket attack that uh, damages the food system and then later on result, uh, results in severe malnutrition of children, if a child uh, is stunted because of that, there's no cure for that. There's no uh, stunting is irreversible. And finally, as Saleha very harrowingly described, explosive weapons are often used to deliberately target child-specific infrastructure, like schools. This report argues that the initial blast, while utterly horrifying, only really paints half the picture. 
Most of the child casualties that are caused by explosive weapons are not the result of the direct blast and the wounds from that blast. Rather, they are the result of indirect effects and the destruction to the food, water sources, shelter and healthcare services. These indirect effects are too often not accounted for in the data, they are not assessed in the literature and not always adequately uh, responded to uh, by humanitarian organisations. The report outlines the predictable harm of explosive violence um, when children is faced with such weapons um, and it traces the harm over the course of a child's life and into adulthood from the moment of the blast to the minutes hours, months, and then years that follow. And the, uh, the report has two distinct strands to it. The first is that um, the harm caused by blast injury lingers throughout a child's life far into adulthood. It looks at paediatric blast injury care and how expensive it is, how resource intensive it is. And it also looks at the increased likelihood of children dying from incidents of explosive violence compared to adults. Children are as much as seven times more likely to die in a blast than an adult. But in order to um, avoid repetition, I'm going to leave Michael to tell us a little bit more about child specific blast injuries. The second strand of the report explores the reverberating effects of explosive violence. So this is when a blast may not uh, result in child casualties, but it will invariably uh, cause child specific harm. Typically, this is when explosive weapons are detonated in a child's community and it damages infrastructure integral to a child's quality of life, such as their home, school, uh, access to medical services, etc. And in order to demonstrate why these indirect effects shouldn't be an afterthought and they shouldn't be an appendix, but they should really be forefront in our minds, we created this rather crude graph that you can see um, on the slide. And the graph compares the number of children reported in our monitor as having been killed and injured by explosive violence between 2011 and 2020 against the number of children who died under five with severe acute malnutrition in Yemen between 2015 and 2018. Now the, the famine that caused this malnutrition was man-made and it has been attributed to the use of explosive weapons by by the Saudi blockade and also uh, Houthi shelling in the north. But um, as you can see, in just three years, over four times as many children were killed indirectly by explosive violence in Yemen than an entire decade of direct casualties from explosive violence globally. And Yemen is just one country. This is just one example. Reverberating effects are difficult to measure and they raise challenging legal and also philosophical questions about attribution. So if a rocket lands on a water irrigation facility in Yemen and it worsens a pre-existing cholera epidemic, sorry, uh, to what extent can we attribute the suffering of the child to the explosive weapon? If maybe four years later there is a new authority or international control of the area, who is to be held responsible for the spread of the disease. Um, as somebody I interviewed uh, remarked, indirect effects are less compelling because they're not always morally clear. However, from what we can see on the graph and the screen, they nonetheless need to be addressed. So rather than walking you through the timeline that I've presented in the report, I'm just going to share with you some of our key findings. So we were first uh, wanted to look at where explosive violence takes place against children. And as you can see here, unfortunately, it takes place in their homes. These are the very places that children are meant to feel safest. And because explosive violence takes place in these urban environments, the effect of the blast can often bounce off the, the walls eight times more than if the blast took place in, a, in an open environment. Then we wanted to look at which type of weapons cause harm for children. And as you can see here, 34% of children are killed and injured by air launch weapons, such as airstrikes. And this raises some quite interesting questions about who perpetrates harm uh, to, explode, uh, to children. And uh, that's something I'll be able to touch on later. We then wanted to look at gender. Our own uh, data set shows that when the gender is known, there are 7% more child casualties than there are female. And this is particularly stark when you look at weapons such as landmines, cluster munitions and explosive remnants of war. 
the graph that you can see on the slide was kindly provided, data, the data for the graph was kindly provided to us by Afghanistan's mine action coordination. And the differences in gender, both uh, with children and in adults, are, are very stark, as you can see. Next, reverberating effects. Now, these are far too numerous in number to mention, and they span through time and indeed space. But for now, let's just examine one. And since uh, Saleh had told us about that very horrifying attack on a school that she witnessed eight years ago with those 28 children, let's stick with education. And we know that schools are deliberately targeted by, uh, by perpetrators with explosive weapons. Um, AOAV data shows that in the last decade, when there have been attacks on schools, 30% of those who have been killed and injured were children. But even when schools are not directly at risk from explosive weapons, when they have not been damaged by explosive violence, the reverberating effects from explosive violence happening in, in an area, a vicinity, a town, will still obstruct a child's access to education. So, for example, if transport services are destroyed, children will not be able to travel to school. If an airstrike damages uh, an electricity grid, children will not be able to prepare schoolwork or homework. If the water supply is compromised, children may not be able to uh, go back into school and maybe have to help their families in uh, fetching water. Equally, this is all compounded by toxic stress, which is induced often by psychological trauma um, from what children may have, the, the general insecurity of war, but also what they have seen uh, when being exposed to explosive violence. We know that the relationship between PTSD and witnessing explosive violence in children is incredibly strong. And then further down the line, we know that if a child is displaced, their access to education, refugee and IDP camps is likely to be limited. And the sad reality is, is that 99% of refugee youth do not get to attend university. This is perhaps the most troubling of the slides, and this is uh, the perpetrators of explosive violence. And in figure 15, you can see that uh, state actors are responsible for 22% of adult casualties. Um, and in figure 16, sorry, you can see that uh, state actors are responsible for 53% of child casualties. Now, this is a, uh, a very stark difference, even though our, the data that we have on adult casualties far outweighs um, um, the data we have on children, it's still highly significant. And we have some highly, uh, some untested hypotheses about why this might be the case, but I would welcome any other explanations that anyone might have in the chat. Um, we think that it is state actors that are more likely to have the capacity to deploy um, air launch weapons, and these weapons will invariably um, cause child harm because they are so wholly indiscriminate. And second, we hypothesize that non-state actors, particularly Salafi jihadi groups, may be more likely to target um, adult infrastructure targets, such as a market or a place of worship, than a school or a nursery, although there are some very notable exceptions to this. So some challenges with data that I've confronted during the report. The first is casualty counting. All too often, children are among the casualties when an incident is reported, and they are frequently uh, treated as genderless. And this has to change if we're going to understand the, the gender-specific uh, effects uh, from explosive violence on children, especially for girls. This is seen with marriage and education. Uh, but there are also uh, occupational effects on boys. If a boy has picked up an explosive remnant of war and lost his hand when he grows up, he's going to be very much limited in, in what he could do for work. In our own uh, data set, only 18% of child casualties um, have a, we know the gender for. So uh, much work is required from states, NGOs, monitoring organisations to make sure that all the data on children is gender disaggregated. And crucially as well, flagging children who have pre-existing disabilities. Reverberating effects. Now, I've already mentioned that these are, this is a bit of a quagmire, and these are very difficult to, to measure. And this was certainly the case prior to actually about two days ago. Um, 
there was no systematic document way of documenting these effects. But two days ago, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research launched its um, new framework, a menu of indicators to measure the effects of explosive violence and their civilian harm. Um, I will also put that uh, report in the chat. And it's worth noting that the list of indicators that you, uh, UNIDIR presents, uh, there's 28 of them, that while they all in some way or form uh, affect children, there are 10 that correspond exclusively to child and maternal well-being. And finally, the long term outcomes of blast injury patients. And this is something that, again, Michael may be able to tell us a little bit more about. But consistently throughout my interviews, um, interviewees reported that we may be able to treat a child and we will know what happens to them in the field hospital. But what happens afterwards, whether there's follow up or rehabilitation, which is incredibly important, we don't really have much data on. Opportunities. So as we kind of speak, there are discussions ongoing to develop an international political declaration on the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, which AOAV wholeheartedly um, supports, which will uh, hopefully strengthen the protection of civilians and specifically children. I've already mentioned the UNIDIR new report on the menu of indicators, and this will really open up the space for some new research. And finally, planning and mitigation strategies. And this is something that I think Rocco will be able to um, enlighten us all a bit about. But I, one of the things this report argues is that states must recognise that not only is the indirect harm from the use of explosive violence uh, harming civilians, but it is disproportionately harming children. And therefore, future planning must calculate the totality of this unintended harm and implement mitigation strategies. I'd just like to finish by saying that the report presents the worst case scenarios and effective intervention, victim assistance, and a greater attention to how military operations affect civilian infrastructure can all ameliorate some of this harm. But so long as explosive weapons continue to be used with their wide area effects in populated areas, the hypothetical timeline of harm that I pre present in the report will continue to be a reality for more and more children. Thank you very much for listening, and I welcome any questions or comments in the Q&A. Thank you very much for that, uh, Verity. Um, and, and, and there are lots of different approaches towards how you present this harm, but I think one of the things that AOAV really strived to do in this was to give a kind of a, a, a chronology. Uh, so we start off in sort of within an hour, with the moment of the blast, then an hour of the blast, a day of the blast, a week of the blast, years after the blast. And, and I think that that is, is um, a, an approach that I would, would welcome to see in other research work as well, because I, I think it does reinforce the reverberating effects. Um, and, and on that point, I'd now like to pass over to, to Michael, who will talk to us about blast injury effects, um, gaps and, and, and uh, need for more research. And, and most importantly, I think, uh, to enlighten us more about what the work that the Pediatric Blast Injury Partnership is doing, because it is such a powerful uh, force of good in this field. Over to you, Michael. Uh, if you just unmute Michael, I think. There you go. Uh, are you able to? Are you able to let me share screen? Uh, you sh should be able to. Uh, oh, there you go. Sorry. Okay. Now you can. Yep. Yeah. It, 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 nothing. Um, I was going to say nothing des desperately exciting, but uh, if I can just get onto this PowerPoint, um, I'll. I'll only put it up because it reinforces something that Verity said. So, look, um, I think this is a fantastic report. Well done for producing it. Um, it's a great project to do while locked down under COVID, and and thank you for inviting me along to talk about it. What it what it really what really struck me was the enormous um, impact that the war in Syria had on child mortality. And, and but we shouldn't think of that as just a blip. It is just very stark. But let me go back maybe 10 years and explain, or maybe longer, explain why the Pediatric Blast Injury Partnership was formed. 
looking back at um, pediatric injury, I discovered that between 2004 and 2017, the coalition military hospitals in Iraq and Afghanistan admitted 42 and a half thousand civilian patients in that period and three and a half thousand of those were children and what we discovered was that um, very little was known about explosive and violent injury uh, of children. Looking back through the data in particularly the UK it was clear that most injuries that happened to children in let's call them western civilized countries are caused by road traffic accidents, deliberate violence by um, often parents sadly, blood trauma, trips and falls and our experience of um, explosive injury and what we in the military would have called high velocity injuries in children was extremely limited because it just doesn't happen very often. I say that until the Manchester bombing, which was probably the largest explosive attack on children in, you know, in, in this country that we've um, seen outside of war. So the Pediatric Blast Injury Partnership was formed, prompted by Save the Children, who contacted the team at Imperial College and a couple of us in the ex-military um, to see what we knew about um, injury, explosive and violent injury to children and what could be done about it. And what that led to was this excellent manual produced, edited by a colleague of mine, Paul Reevely, the Pediatric Blast Injury Manual, which basically brought together the, um, the state of the knowledge that we had, which was pediatric intensivists, pediatric anaesthetists, people who'd worked in conflict zones, who came together just to document what we thought should be common knowledge from point of first injury, first responder, um, extraction of of casualties from point of injury, um, the immediate surgery, and as far as we could do, the, the rehabilitation and psychological support. But what it highlighted was that there was very, very little detailed documented um, description of what these injuries were. And much of it came from the, um, the military joint trauma register that was um, that was informed by those um, those admissions to military hospitals over those um, fifteen years or so. So, having produced the manual, we thought, what could we do next? And this is where we have hit a bit of a, a brick wall, in in a sense. The intention was to get together all of the organisations that are likely to be involved in treating children who've been injured in the circumstances described. So so graphically by um, Salia and Verity, and get them to agree on what has always proved very difficult, and that was sharing of knowledge and shared data collection. And that process was moving ahead until COVID uh, prevented us from traveling. And, and one of the key things about bringing together these international alliances is that you have to actually get people together in a room and go through a process and get them to agree. And that unfortunately has been put on hold to some extent. Um, and so, so what we've been relying on really is um, piecemeal um, coalitions that have, have come together. And actually the, the only thing I'd really like to say is, is that the, the most significant uh, advance has been in the, in the thing that um, the Verity just mentioned that came out only a couple of days ago. And this was this publication, the menu of indicators to measure the reverberating effects of, of, of civilians. And this is an excellent document that has taken a couple of years to bring together. And it shows there is a sort of pincer movement around um, attacks on civilians, uh, of, of which, unfortunately, children are a significant um, subpopulation. And this goes much further than just the, the um, physical and health effects. This does look at the impact of explosive violence on hospitals, on health facilities in, in the round, and on schools. And it follows very much the menu set by the sustainable, sustainable Development Goals. And it gives us this long list of indicators. And so I put the link at the bottom, which Verity will put in the chat room, so that you can download this. It's, it's really accessible. It, it's an excellent document, and it brings it together. Uh, and so what were the issues that we started to think about? Well, what we know is that, first of all, not very many people outside of the military, 
the ICRC and people like MSF really have any expertise in delivering high quality care to children who've been injured. And, and the treatment of children who have, have suffered these sort of traumatic injuries is quite complicated because there's not enough known even about how they respond to injury. And the intent was to try and build up a better um, basis of knowledge about what actually needs to be done. But what we also know is that most of what we understand is around the immediate treatment, immediate surgery. There's very, very little um, research or documented evidence of what happens to children who've been injured and who are then passed over to often inadequate local, national healthcare facilities. There's very little that we know about the impact of their injury. Most people who've been injured, we know this very well from treating the military, require multiple interventions over several, often many years, particularly for those who are still growing, to revise the treatment that they've been given. That requires quite complicated surgery, what we call orthoplastic, which means a combination of often orthopedic and plastic surgery um, at the same time um, to, to help these people with their rehabilitation and, and improving their functions. And there's no dedicated rehabilitation for them. So that although some excellent work has been done by people like um, Humanity International on rehabilitation of people with um, limb injuries and prostheses, there's very little actually again documented and very little systematic um, research in place. And so what we would hope to do over the longer term is agree on data collection methodology and that would be used as a way to understand how health systems in national, in, in the countries affected, are being um, impacted by having to deal with, and we focus here on children, but I think one could say broadly, people who have been injured by explosive violence, what the, what the effect on their systems has been and how that might be improved, not to try to bring them up to the sorts of standards we might expect and might see in, uh, in the UK, in America, in Western countries, but try and identify the best ways of um, improving care for the most uh, using the limited resources available. And that's a long-term project that we, um, that we would hope to follow up. And it will be assisted by, by this work done by, um, by UNIDEAR. And I suppose that's really, um, that's really all I want to say. The Paediatric Blast Injury Partnership set out to improve the immediate care of children, but what it highlighted was how little we know about the, the um, intermediate and, and longer term care. We've built up a huge body of knowledge about how to treat adults, predominantly because of the impact of this sort of explosive violence on soldiers. We've seen an awful lot of it happening to people in the affected countries who don't benefit from that care. And the longer term goal must be to both improve the care, but really importantly, to focus much more attention on what's happening, because only by putting pressure on those people who are parties to this, um, this violence can we hope to have any impact. Thank you, Ian. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so if you could uh, uh, stop sharing your screen, I, um, I think we can move now on to... Um... It's always difficult, isn't it, to do that? Which one's to press? I've got it. There, there go. we are. Um, thank you very much for that, Michael. Um, and yeah, it, it does feel like we're there. There is, as you say, a kind of a, a, a conference, a, com, a confluence of of research and attempts, which hopefully will will turn um, the, a greater sum of human knowledge. Um, and on that, we'll now turn to Rocco Bloom from War Child, and Rocco will speak to us not only about the grave violations uh, against children, but ultimately the outcomes of this, issues um, leading towards accountability and also uh, the, the dangers of intergenerational conflict. Thank you, Rocco. Thank you, Ian. I wanna thank um, the rest of the panel. I've learned a huge amount from this discussion today. It's um, a fantastic opportunity to be here with you. Excellent report, really first rate, Verity. Congratulations on this. It's you've demonstrated the profound impact of moments of violence on the entire life of people, families and communities. I should say a little bit about War Child. We work in 10 countries. We deliver services to children, 
who are living in conflict and recovering from conflict. And we also undertake a lot of international advocacy to bring attention to grave rights violations that take place against children. In all the countries we work, we see that children are the victims of these grave rights violations. And just to explain what this term means, a grave violation, um, 20 years ago, the United Nations, in recognition of how egregious rights violations in conflict against children are, created this list of six grave violations. And they endeavored to create a system that reports on, um, monitors and holds to account the perpetrators of these rights violations. And they include the killing and maiming of children, attacks on schools and hospitals, child recruitment, etc. So I want to focus my comments on a particular point made towards the end of the report when Verity was talking about perpetrators and the fact that the primary culprits for explosive violence are state armed forces and air forces in particular, and the international state coalitions that bring their massive air power to conflicts such as in Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq. It's often difficult to influence the behavior of armed groups, but all states are members of the United Nations, signatories to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, bound by the Geneva Convention, international humanitarian law, and there are other frameworks such as the Grave Violations Framework that is there to hold states to account. However, it seems that these deterrents aren't working. And we know they're not working because of the raw evidence that comes from uh, the United Nations. The monitoring and report reporting mechanism that collects data on grave violations has recorded that in the last decade, there's been a 170% increase in the number of grave violations. We saw from just from the years 2018 to 2019, a doubling of the number of attacks on schools and hospitals by state actors from around 250 to 503 individual attacks on schools and hospitals. And one, just to take one particular example, one particular actor in Syria and Iraq, the Royal Air Force for a four year period between 2014 and 2018 deployed just under 4,000 bombs and missiles over densely populated areas in the campaign to destroy the Islamic State group. So we're seeing very concentrated use of ordnance, aerial ordnance, over a short period of time in densely populated areas. So we're not short of evidence. Despite having this abundance of evidence and despite the range of tools that are available to hold states to account, we see very little impact. So why is that? And to suggest a few reasons as to, to why we have this mismatch between the amount of evidence and the amount of action. Firstly, over recent years, I would suggest we've seen a normalization of an overwhelming use of force being used to counter violent extremist groups and armed groups that are labeled as violent extremists. I think very few would doubt that a group like the Islamic State group could only be stopped through armed force. Yet the proportionality of the international response is in question. In the case of uh, Mosul, where Warchild works in Mosul and around the, uh, uh, the state of Nineveh, um, there are varying estimates to the number of civilians that were killed during the final stages of the campaign to destroy ISIS. But there are the estimates range between 6,000 civilians and tens of thousands of civilians were killed, a large number through uh, the aerial campaign. So this is a, a colossal civilian impact. Yet there was a relatively muted media response to that civilian death rate. And I think that could be said of a number of other conflicts around the world. Saleya spoke of the situation in Syria where we've seen um, an absolute colossal um, impact from aerial ordnance, uh, which again, it seems to have been normalized, just the, 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 the daily amount of information we're, we're seeing in terms of this civilian impact. And um, this, speaks to a, uh, a lowering of the threshold of acceptable death in certain conflicts, especially in the Middle East. There's certainly been a notable lack of interest from Western governments in terms of understanding and investigating the civilian death caused by those aerial campaigns. There's also a fairly deliberate effort to ignore evidence. The findings of reports like the annual Secretary General's report on children and armed conflict, that's the annual report that collects together all of the uh, grave violation evidence, uh, 
uh, and it has a list at the end of that report, an annex, it's known as the list of shame. And in it, you see all of those state actors that have been found to have been committing a pattern of rights violations and armed groups that commit a pattern of rights violations. For the last five years, if you looked at that report every year, you would have seen that the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen is listed there alongside the Islamic State group, Boko Haram, the Taliban. So it's clearly, it's embarrassing for many states to admit that their allies are in such company. But finally, a more shameful reason for there being a lack of um, attention and action is that on that particular, the particular process of listing states for the grave violations they've committed, um, the process has become very politicized of determining who should be on that list in the last few years. And some governments have exerted undue pressure on the Secretary General to avoid them and their allies from being listed. So the International Coalition in Afghanistan the Israeli armed forces um, have not been listed, although uh, a mountain of evidence over recent years. The Saudi-led coalition was recently removed from that list despite overwhelming evidence. So this is a bleak picture, clearly. Um, if the formal mechanisms that are in place to hold states to account are not working, then what will work to change the calculations of governments that are using indiscriminate air power? To focus on those states, firstly, that are, are more responsive to public and civil society pressure, if you look at the UK, one tangible solution is for states to put in place a casualty tracking mechanism. So if you understand the impact of your military operations, it's possible, far more possible, to understand what needs to be done to prevent civilian harm, what actions need to be taken in the planning stage, the operation stage. The UK doesn't currently have a casualty tracking system in terms of its military operations. And Wartard, along with our civil society peers, are undertaking great efforts to argue the case for it to be put in place. And the same is happening in the United States. So this is a tangible solution that would enable, at the very beginning, to understand impact as a way to then work out how to reduce impact. Um, despite the fact that I've made a bit of a case for states not acting on evidence, collecting evidence is critical and ensuring the integrity of the UN reporting system is, is vital because we never know what the future holds. We never knew um, 11 years ago that the regimes in Yemen, in Syria, in Egypt and so forth would fall because of internal um, revolutions, regimes do fall and the evidence that's collected could one, one day, hopefully, be used in international court proceedings against perpetrators. But moving away from evidence, evidence isn't enough. I think there's, that, that's profoundly clear that despite a mountain of evidence, it's the political interests of states that determine their actions and behavior. So some of the most important things that influence behavior uh, are the media, the investigative media, critically to expose incidents of civilian harm and the negligence or the intent that caused them um, and to keep alive this, this, these stories and narratives in the public consciousness is critical because um, in countries like our own, we're able to hold the government to account and that's where an activist, an active parliament is critical to um, keep the state aware of its obligations regarding international humanitarian law and rights and to keep that at the absolute forefront. Um, I'd, I wanna say finally, um, working with civil servants in the military. So a number of us in, in agencies that work on rights work directly with the military and civil servants. And on a positive note, I must say that the civil servants that we work with in the MOD and the FCDO are absolutely committed to this agenda of protecting civilians. Um, they're working in institutions that are often driven by other interests and objectives, but um, clearly there's a, a very strong consensus amongst everyone who works on these issues that it's in the interests of all the people who are affected directly and in the interests of our own state, our own society, our own moral values to keep working on these issues and to see progress. So I think there is a great amount to be hopeful for. Um, I'm going to stop there and 
hand back to you, so thank you. Thank you very much, Rocco. Um, that was a, 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 a brilliant summary and, and, and highlighting some very, very um, key issues. Um, it, it strikes me that, that really we're all arguing essentially for the same thing. We're arguing for addressing impunity, uh, leading more research, uh, ensuring accountability, demanding transparency, encouraging collaborations, and seeking the oxygen of publicity in order to uh, address, I think, um, this, this, this dominant uh, issue. Um, and, and, and I think that the reverberating effects uh, that we've, we've heard about, not only the UNIDIR attempts to try and quantify them, but actually talking, you know, leading back to Celia's own, own very vivid memories of something that happened eight years ago, but clearly stays with her today, um, you know, on a very personal level, my 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 um, my father, my father's father, was killed in the first war, in the Second World War, and um, the reverberations of that death had an impact on my father that, in turn, you know, impacted his relationship. I would say with me, in in so far as the, the 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 what happens to a child in terms of grieving, even if they're not directly impacted, can have profound intergenerational impacts. Um, and, and I think children can often also be used as, as icons, um, abused as icons to justify war as well. Either the outrage of attacks on children then fuels propagandist battles that demands more war, or even uh, in the case of the first ever um, suicide bomber that was recorded in the um, wider Muslim world uh, happened in Iran. It was a 13 year old suicide bomber who, who um, was uh, a child soldier and blew himself up in war. Um, and, and he became uh, a hero of the uh, Iranian side in the Iran-Iraq war. And one could argue very, very uh, um, accurately, I would, I would say, that the icon of that child suicide bomber en ended up influencing legions of other suicide bombers going forward. And it's no surprise that over half of all suicide, suicide bombers recorded since 1970 have been in Iraq, a third in Syria, and almost all the rest in countries where Boko Haram operates, such as Nigeria and Cameroon. But this isn't just a modern event. In fact, in, the, um, in World War II, there were 3,000 child kamikaze fighter pilots recruited by the Japanese state. So um, the child as weapon, as well as the child as victim of explosive violence is also a fundamental issue. We have a number of questions here. So I'll, I'll just start off um, with uh, Maya Ishmael's uh, request. Can Verity please explain more about the data that shows the responsible party for children casualties? What is meant by unknown, which constitutes a large proportion if not state or non-state? Um, I can very briefly answer that before I move to Verity, but essentially, un unless the um, action on armed violence is data, it can exquisitely state who was the perpetrator. We, we, we tend to ref refer to unknown. So a lot of airstrikes we, we cannot be absolutely assured of without on the ground research. But Verity, would you like to answer that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I won't reiterate what Ian had said, but in the case of adults, 34.84% of casualties, uh, we don't know who the perpetrator was, and for children it's 2062 But I still think even taking into that, that into account that the difference in uh, the status of perpetrators between adults and children is still noteworthy, even if you take in uh, those figures of the unknown data. Um, the next question is from Hetty from MAG. Um, uh, could you expand if possible about the reasoning behind the gender difference in people being impacted? Why do you think that more women are impacted across all age ranges? Um, I, I'll just answer that briefly, but I'd like to hear um, from Michael and Rocco and Celia, actually, if, you, if you've thought anything around the gender issue. The data seems to suggest that um, boys and men are more likely to be directly impacted by explosive violence and girls and women are more likely to then suffer the impacts of the reverberating consequence of explosive violence. This might be because they are, they lose uh, a breadwinner in the family and the woman then has to, I mean, I, 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 I've interviewed 
uh, people who were working in the sex industry in um, Sri Lanka, for instance, who were forced into prostitution because uh, they, the, the breadwinner had been killed during the conflict. Um, uh, obviously, uh, um, a disrupted family in certain areas might lead towards a, a more abuse of young girls. But what we generally see in the data is that young boys and men are more likely to be impacted. But um, can I ask Rocco, what do you think about the nature of the targeting of young men as combatants, um, i.e. the assumption that if you're an 18 year old man in an area, you, you might be a legitimate target. Does Warchild have, have data on, on the gender around that or, or thoughts? Sure, I, I think an, an interesting um, related point is that we do a lot of work on children recruited into armed groups and armed forces. And what we see there is that boys are there's a very strong recognition that um, a boy in an armed group is uh, a child soldier worthy of uh, being demobilized and reintegrated. But girls, when they're taken into an armed group, usually the armed group will deny that that girl is a, a soldier, that they have been militarized. They are a wife. They, are, they take on a different gender role within that um, environment, or well, they're presented as that, and therefore they don't have the same access to reintegration. They're not perceived by the international community to be the same as boys. So the perception of uh, um, those who collect data and those who respond and, and work with these children and those gender assumptions uh, play a direct role on the services that those children received. So that's slightly different from what you're talking about, which is around the impact of direct armed violence. We don't really look at it um, uh, in terms of explosive, the impact of explosive weapons on the different genders. But um, just to speak generally, the, the lack of disaggregated data, especially on gender and age, cuts across the entire humanitarian sector. Um, it's certainly in terms of uh, refugee um, and displaced persons' responses, there's uh, a complete dearth of data. There's more pressure to increase that. Um, so there's lots more that can be done from within our sector, I think. Michael, could I ask you about the notion of gender and possibly from a surgical perspective? I mean, in terms of uh, the, a medical approach towards, does, do you see great variations in terms of the, the outcomes or the, the different approaches based on a, a child's gender if they're harmed by explosive violence? Um, that's a bit of a broad question, but um, in terms of disaggregation, what, what we saw in the, in the um, series I've mentioned children admitted to military facilities it's probably a, a two-thirds male one-third female in Afghanistan and Iraq and there is an assumption um, which, which seems logical that in in some countries and particularly the countries where we have seen um, these levels of conflict over the last 15 years girls are less likely to be out and about than boys Boys are, you know, more adventurous. They, they they will be more inquisitive. They will be out at the battlefield. So if they're caught in the open, it's more likely that they will be boys. What we don't know from Syria is the impact of indiscriminate bombing in built-up areas, where an awful lot of people were killed in their homes. And I think we are fairly confident that there was a fairly equal distribution in those countries. Sadly. Um, in terms of, uh, of treatment, I, I've not seen any research that, that demonstrates whether boys or girls are more likely to suffer. In the, um, in the, the, the figures, I, I wish I could pull up the slide now, It'll take me a few minutes though. When um, we, I say we, the company I was, was working for indirectly, Aspen Medical, set up three trauma hospitals around Mosul in 20, was it 2016, 17? Again, we saw very much that um, two thirds, one third sort of split of, of the children who came through those facilities. Uh, they're slightly more complicated because in that kind of warfare, you know, the liberation battle for Mosul, it was the boys who were out and about, they were acting as runners, they were looking for food, they were you know, perhaps performing a function looking after their families, but there is no doubt that they were more likely to be injured. Some of them, of course, would have been um, sucked into um, working for, for one side or the other, again, because they were much more likely to be, to be out and about. 
So the evidence that we've seen so far suggests that boys are probably um, you know, more than twice as likely to be the, those who are injured, but the impact of injury on them is probably the same for both sexes. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, so, Laya, the, the, the next question I think up um, really could, because something I think you'd like to possibly answer is, that, is, is this, is, would anyone like to speak to the relative importance of stories and narratives versus numbers and data and mobilizing support for better protection of children? And as a, as a filmmaker, as a, as a writer, as a journalist, um, I think that might speak to your, your strengths. Do you want to comment about storytelling in, in, in advocacy in a way? Yeah, I think, uh, again, it, just drawing on personal experience, I mean, we, we've been reading about uh, airstrikes and attacks on, on, on various targets right from the word, right from the very beginning of the war in Syria, for example. But um, I, that day, and I thought I was pretty informed, but that day was like nothing else. I mean, to actually see... Um, uh, you know, the agony, uh, to hear the voices, to hear the screams, uh, the smell, you know, every single sense is heightened when you're in that environment. Um, and it makes it real. Um, it, it, even, even now with COVID in our own, you know, that we're facing right now, we know what the statistics are. We know um, the, the over 100,000 deaths that have happened. Um, but yet when you get to know just one individual story and you can, your, own, your own self can relate to it and think of yourself in that position, I think that gives that, m those kind of things make the numbers alive and real. And what we need is, you know, what's the purpose of the storytelling? Well, it's not just to tell stories, it's to try to give those that are in the positions of power on the right pay scales uh, to do something about it to then do something about it you know look you're they may well not be in syria themselves experiencing uh, an attack but the next best thing is to try to bring them those stories it isn't just for the, when when you're in these areas people want their their story told. They want the world to know. They speak directly to the camera because it is their voice to the world. But sadly, sadly, what we have seen uh, with Syria especially is, is the rise of fake news. And even though you are pointing cameras and, and filming it in actuality, what is happening, it is then being challenged by um, a network of people who are suggesting it's fake. Um, I think storytelling is an incredibly important part of it. And I think together with data, um, incredibly important tools, but something has to be done with it. That's my, my perspective. Indeed, and, and I, I think it, the body of work that you've produced over the years very much shows that you, you do take lived experiences, data and and hard evidence, and I think I think you're right in addressing the, the the fact that fake news is is a very powerful weapon being used uh, against the, the very things that we were seeking for: transparency, impunity, accountability. But um, I don't think we've got any more questions. So um, unless any of the other panelists would like to to say anything that they may have forgotten in in the Zoom moment. Well, actually, actually what you just reminded me of something with that, that last question. It was, it was quite interesting. It's a combination, isn't it? And there's nothing like a cele celebrity profile or a, a, you know, a, a, a newsreader focusing attention on something. The thing that struck me, I think it was only yesterday, Joe Wiley has been talking for you know, several weeks about her sister who has learning disabilities and the iniquity of not vaccinating um, people or not prioritizing them. And she made such a fuss about it yesterday, the government turned, turned around and changed the policy. But they've had the evidence for that for weeks. So it is a combination. Once you've got the evidence, it, it's not even a question of putting it in the right journal sometimes. It needs someone to pick it up and shout about it. And that's the, that's the way to affect change. And that's why, you know, this government, our government, has actually, um, thankfully, put an awful lot of effort into the agenda, which is called protection of civilians. 
as a result of the UNSCR, I think it was 1326 or something, they actually have a, a military policy, which is JSP 1326, named after that a resolution. So it does need people to, to shout and hold them to account, which is what good responsible journalists do, Ian. I don't know if you know any. <laughs> Guilty as charged. Uh, yes, uh, Salaya and I have both uh, been at the BBC and uh, done, our, done our time in the trenches there. Um, well, th thank you. That, and, and yes, I think that's a call to action. We should, we should be engaged more. And I think that this call really has, has galvanized thoughts around this. Um, so th thank you very much, um, Michael, Rocco, Salaya, Verity. Um, I would, uh, we will be in touch on email to all of those who've kindly joined us on this call to share the PDF uh, of our report. And we would be very grateful if you could pass it on to others. Um, this uh, report was, um, the recording will be on our uh, website. So we will um, ensure we embed this talk uh, on, on the page where the report is, 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 is landed. Um, and um, I just want to say that thank you very much to the Norwegian government for having funded the research into this. Uh, this is part of a series of reports that AOAV will be doing over the next uh, forthcoming months on reverberating effects. And we're going to be looking at a variety of uh, singular weapon types, uh, such as grenades, uh, tank shells, grad rockets, uh, air strikes, and landmines and look at both the UNIDIR and other measures towards the reverberating effects through the prism of those weapon types. And so we'll be presenting that in the next few months um, when some field research is permitted. Um, and just to, for other people, in case you, you're not across this, um, next week, uh, the Irish government is um, taking uh, feedback for the draft resolution on avoiding the use of explosive weapons with wide area effects in populated areas as a political commitment. Um, and so we hope that this and other evidence, which obviously uh, Michael and Rocco's um, have both um, helped create a body of evidence who will, will help influence states more and uh, the issue of children in conflict will become um, uh, something that is almost rooted in a political commitment to avoid. So um, with that optimistic note, um, I thank you all for your time. And um, I very much look forward to seeing you in different forums. And thank you again. Um, and I hope that um, we all meet in a post-lockdown utopia. <laughs> Speak soon. Thank you very much.